You're fine as long as the kids are good. Hello, welcome to Lovey Storytelling. How are you doing today? We are going to be reading a story. And before we read Ben Hur, we are going to be reading the Bible. And make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the bell to never miss another video. So. You've been watching a lot of YouTube, haven't you? Yeah. So I know how big it is. Thank you, one person, for coming on. Mm -hmm. so, Thanks, Mom. Thank you. I'll, I'll hand it off to Heavy D. Hi. So I um, got into my uh, quick and easy warm clothes. Um, this is like ancient army PTs. Yeah, I love you, JJ, too. Okay, so, um, all right. So I just want to, hi, two people that are here. I appreciate you. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say a little something before we start today because I, um, last night I worked on the Mara series and um, thanks for the hearts. Um, and this afternoon I worked on uh -huh. the best the, sorry, the Bronze Bow series. So now both of those series have um, the time stamps. So if you go to them on YouTube, um, I've got uh, times marked in the descriptions where each of the chapters begin. And in the process of doing that, I realized that I skipped a chapter in Mark. Can you believe that? Um, so... Um, because when we were reading the Bronze Bow, I was reading it from the Book of Mark. And um, on the second to last episode, um, I think I had attempted it several times, like at least two or three times, and um, we hadn't gotten started. And I think that I had read through Mark one time before I, before, um, bef through this particular chapter, before I realized that I hadn't actually read it on an actual live stream that was actually recording. So, without further ado, I'm going to read Mark chapter 15, because we skipped it last year. And there's nothing worse than skipping a whole chapter in the Bible. So we're going to do Mark chapter, chapter 15, and then we're going to go to our New Testament book starting tomorrow. Our new, our new New Testament book. Hey, JJ, your window is still open, by the way. Um, all right, so this is Mark chapter 15. Um, the comments will be in, or the, the link will be in the description if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're watching this on the live stream, I'm sorry, I can't do that. But you can read it from your Bible Hub app or from your favorite Bible. Um, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and you can read it from yours. Mark chapter 15. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things, and Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now, as the, at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him released for them, Barabbas, instead. And Pilate again asked them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? 
But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Incidentally, if you want to uh, read a nice 21-page uh, paper about Pilate, um, I can send it to you in email form. Be happy, and you can learn all that I was able to get on Pilate uh, when I took my New Testament class, whenever that was. <clears throat> I'm going to continue now in Mark chapter 15. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexandria, Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them, to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe." Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is also the opening line of Psalm 22, if you can believe it. Um, lost my place. And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom which, by the way, doesn't happen normally. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger and of Joses and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him, and there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who also who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead, and when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, who, by the way, it wasn't going to just say that he was just for fun, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus saw 
where he was laid. I just want to read one, a, 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 a little bit more into, this is chapter 16, but it's okay. It's really important because we already read it. Um, when the Sabbath was passed, this is the day after the Sabbath. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices. They bought spices on the day after the Sabbath, according to 16.1, so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, which clearly was not the same day that they bought the spices, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. So if they bought the spices on the first day after the Sabbath, and they went to the tomb on the first day of the week, at very early in the morning, they obviously didn't buy the spices earlier than very early in the morning, because that wouldn't have been allowed, because it would have been the Sabbath until the sun rose, right? No. It's until the sun sets. Forget that. But at least, I, I know the marketplace wouldn't have been open at least until the sun rose. So my point is here that they went to the market on the day after the Sabbath, which must have been must have been Friday the day after the Sabbath. And then, because it was a special Sabbath because of the Passover, which we can learn about if we read Leviticus, and if you doubt me, then we will read Leviticus. Yeah, Mom's already throwing up downstairs. Um, uh, and then the next day was another Sabbath because they had special Sabbaths because of the Holy Week that they had during Passover. There were two special Sabbaths that were a week apart from each other that were based on the lunar calendar, not on the weekly calendar that the Jews had. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and just, because we can't end there, we're going to just stop at verse 8. Uh, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene Ma and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment and seized him, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Um, the rest of it is contested um, of the book of Mark, whether it's in the early, uh, in early manuscripts or not, uh, regardless of whether or not the rest of it is. Um, I just want to bring out this point to mention that I do believe that Jesus was crucified on a Wednesday which is obviously against the popular conception that he was crucified on a Friday. Um, and this being one of the passages that very clearly illustrates that there was at least two days here um, after the Sabbath, because there was the one day that they bought the spices, and the next day would have been the Sabbath, and the following day was the first day of the week. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Um, there's lots of other people that believe this, and um, I can refer you to lots of articles on that. If you are interested, I will provide those. Um, without further ado, Kimberly, do you have a synopsis for us? Yeah, as long as you're done rambling. She didn't flip through anything, and I, she said, as long as you're done rambling. Which also, I will say, because, um, and I know that not all of you were here, 
But um, so what I did last night and today um, when I wasn't doing my classes that I had to do for work because I had two classes that I had to do today. But um, what I was doing was um, I put timestamps on all of the Mara videos, which are in a nice little playlist on YouTube. And I put timestamps on all of the time out. I put timestamps on all of the bronze bow videos, which are all on YouTube. Um, and so you can go to those playlists, and if you click on one of those videos, it will give you the timestamp for each of the chapters and also for the book of the Bible that we read. And the reason why we read Mark 15 is because I discovered that I had skipped it when we were reading Mark 15. That, so that's why we read Mark 15 today. Um, you mean when we were reading Mark? Yes, when we were reading Mark, we skipped 15. Um, probably because I read it, and um, it was one of those days where the, the internet glitched out and I wasn't able to capture the live stream. So it is what it is. Kimberly, stop. You're distracting me. So without further ado, I already said that, but here's Kimberly. Synopsis. <laughs> what happened in the last few chapters... Um, well, Ben Hur talked with Simonidas and Esther for a bit longer, and they um, decided that um, the Christ, or Jesus, as we all know, um, would be born poor. And they're like, yeah, it says in such and such in the Torah, and then they were looking up a bunch of things in the Torah, which actually, it's like the first few books of the Bible, I forget how many, but, um, it's basically the, it's basically the Jewish Bible. So they looked up in the Torah and everything, and then, um, they found that he would go through, like, Jerusalem on a donkey, and, um, it says that somewhere, <laughs> and it actually does happen, and I think they're gonna try to find him based on some oh. of the things all around the house looking for my water bottle. It's right next to Kimberly. <laughs> Keep talking, I'm gonna fill it up. They're gonna, um, they're gonna try to find Jesus based on some of the descriptions that the Torah gave them, like some things that the prophets wrote the Messiah would do. And I think that is, um, about it, but I wanted to, um, I wanted to say something. So, you know, um, somebody, um, I forget who, but somebody actually went in, like, in the story where Jesus was crucified, and apparently, um, the torture that he endured while he was going to the cross would have killed him before he even got there. So, yeah, it was really bad from what I've heard. Okay. And here is Dad. Okay, so I know that, sorry, I know that Kimberly was talking a little bit about the Torah. Um, so, a little history that I know. Um, sorry, I was running around the house. So, um, the... Torah is obviously the first five books of the Bible. Um, Moses wrote them, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, we read Genesis, was one of the Old Testament books that we read recently, um, over the fall or the summer, recently, relatively. Um, um, tells all the stories of the patriarchs and all that. Um, now, they might say Torah when they're referring to the Hebrew Bible, because um, if you notice, they pulled out Isaiah. They read, for unto us a child is born, for unto us a ch ch child is given. They pulled out Micah. They read, the child is going to be born in Bethlehem. They pulled out Jeremiah. They read whatever he said. Yeah, and so those aren't books that are written by Moses, um, obviously, because they're named after the people that wrote them. But uh, usually, if you were in a library, you would just refer to that library of scriptures as a Torah. Um, 
that's my understanding. I, I heard that. I don't know um, exactly how accurate that is, but that's that's what I've heard. Um, more to follow on that. But um, so obviously the scriptures that he was reading was not all from Moses. Maybe one or two of them was. I can't remember exactly what all of them were. Um, but it was quite a few scriptures that they were quoting. Um, Lou Wallace is obviously giving a lot of information about Jesus that the Jews would have referred to in order to identify the Messiah when they saw him. And so they can look at Jesus and the miraculous birth that he was given, and they can see that this guy obviously is the Christ, and they wanted to support him. Now, obviously, they're not looking at him as a spiritual Christ. They're looking at him as a military Christ, and... um, uh, Christos, of course, is the Greek word that means Lord. So um, there, um, you know, uh, Messiah is the Hebrew equivalent, I suppose. I think Messiah really means more of a of a spiritual um, understanding. Anyway, so without rambling too much, because we've already rambled a lot today. Um, and I did notice, uh, listening to all my previous videos that I do ramble a lot. So if you don't like listening to it, then just turn it off. I don't mind. It's all right. I'm getting lots of views, so it's fine. Chapter 10. Posted for the race. The day before the games in the afternoon, all Irderim's racing property was taken to the city and put in quarters adjoining the circus. Along with it, the good man carried a great deal of property, not of that class, so that, so with servants, retainers mounted and armed horses in leading, cattle driven, camels laden with baggage, and his outgoing from the orchard was not likely a tribal mi- migration. The people along the road failed not to laugh at his motley procession. On the other side, it was observed that, with all his irascibility, he was not in the least offended by their rudeness. He was under surveillance, as he had reason to believe the informer would describe the semi-barbarous show with with which he came up to the races. The Romans would laugh, the city would be amused, but what cared he? Next morning, the pageant would be far on the road to the desert, and going with it would be every movable thing of value, of value belonging to the orchard, everything save such as were essential to the success of his four. He was, in fact, started home. His tents were all folded. The dower was no more. In twelve hours, all would be out of reach. Pursue who might. A man is newer, safer, than when he is under the laugh, and the shrewd old Arab knew it. Neither he nor Ben-Hur overestimated the influence of Messala. It was their opinion, however, that he would not begin active measures against them until after the meeting in the circus. If defeated there, especially if defeated by Ben-Hur, they might instantly look for the worst he could do. He might not even wait for advices from Gratus. With his view, they shaped their course and were prepared to betake themselves out of harm's way. They rode together, now in good spirits, calmly confident of success on the morrow. On the way, they came upon Malik in waiting for them. The faithful fellow gave no sign by which it was possible to infer any knowledge on his part of the relationship so recently admitted between Ben-Hur and Simonidus, or of the treaty between them and Ilderim. He exchanged salutations as usual and produced a paper, saying to the sheik, I have here the notice of the editor of the games just issued in which you will find your horses published for the race. You will find it you will find in it also the order of exercises without waiting good sheik i congratulate you upon your victory he gave the paper over and leaving the worthy to master it turned to ben hur to you also son of arius my congratulations there is nothing now to prevent your meeting messala every condition preliminary to the race is compiled with i have the assurance from the editor himself "'I thank you, Malik,' said Ben-Hur. Malik proceeded. "'Your color is white, 
and masalas mixed scarlet and gold. The good effects of the choice are visible already. Boys are now hawking white ribbons along the streets. Tomorrow, every Arab and Jew in the city will wear them. In the circus, you will see the white fairly divide the galleries with the red. The galleries, but not the tribunal over the Porta Pompeii. No, the scarlet and gold will rule there. But if we win, Malak chuckled with the pleasure of the thought, if we win, how the dignitaries will tremble. They will bet, of course, according to their scorn of everything not Roman, two, three, five to one on Masala, because he is Roman. Dropping his voice yet lower, he added, it ill becomes a Jew of good standing in the temple to put his money at such a hazard. Yet, in confidence, I will have a friend next behind the council's seat to accept offers of three to one, or five, or ten. The madness may go to such height. I have put to his order six thousand shekels for the purpose." "'Nay, Malik,' said Ben-Hur, "'a Roman will wager only in his Roman coin. "'Suppose you find your friend tonight "'and place to his order centuri in such amount as you choose. "'And look you, Malik, let him be instructed to seek wages, wagers "'with Masala and his supporters. "'Ildarum's four against Masala's.' "'Malik reflected a moment. "'The effect will be to center interest upon your cont contest.' The very thing I seek, Malik. I see, I see. I, Malik, would you serve perfectly help me to fix the public eye upon our race, Masalas and mine? Malik spoke quickly. It can be done. Then let it be done, said Ben-Hur. Enormous wagers offered will answer. If the offers are accepted, all the better. Malik turned his eyes watchfully upon Ben-Hur. "'Shall I not have back the equivalent of his robbery?' said Ben-Hur, partly to himself. "'Another opportunity may not come. And if I could break him in fortune as well as in pride, our father Jacob could take no offense.' A look of determined will knit his handsome face, giving emphasis to his further speech. "'Yes, I shall have it. Hark, Malik! Stop not in thy offer of Sesteri. Advance him to talents, if any there be who dare so high. Five, ten, twenty talents, aye, fifty, so the wager be with Messala himself. It is a mighty sum, said Malik. I must have security. So thou shalt. Go to Simonidus and tell him I wish the matter arranged. Tell him my heart is set on the ruin of my enemy, and that the opportunity hath such excellent promise that I choose such hazards. On our side be the god of our fathers. Go, good Malik, let this not slip. And Malik, greatly delighted, gave him parting salutation and started to ride away, but returned presently. Your pardon, he said to Ben-Hur. There was another matter. I could not get near Messala's chariot myself, but I had another measure it. And from his report, its hub stands quite a palm higher from the ground than yours. A palm? So much? cried Ben-Hur joyfully. Then he leaned over to Malik. As thou art a son of Judah, Malik, and faithful to thy kin, get thee a seat in the gallery over the gate of triumph, down close to the balcony in front of the pillars, and watch well when we make the turns there. Watch well, for if I have favor at all, I will. Nay, Malik, let it go unsaid. Only get thee there and watch well. At that moment a cry burst from Ilderim. Ha! By the splendor of God, what is this? He drew near Ben-Hur, with a finger pointing on the face of the notice. Read, said Ben-Hur. No, better not. Ben-Hur took the paper, which signed by the prefect of the province as editor, performed the office of a modern program, giving particularly the several dis divertisements provided for the occasion. It informed the public that there would be a first procession of extraordinary splendor, that the procession would be succeeded by the customary honors to the, go to the god Consus, whereupon the games would begin, running, leaping, wrestling, boxing, each in the order stated. 
The names of the competitors were given with their several nationalities and schools of training, the trials in which they had been engaged, the prizes won, and the prizes now offered. Under the latter head, the sums of money were stated in illuminated letters telling of the departure of the day when the simple chaplet of pine or laurel was fully enough for the victor, hungering for glory as something better than riches and content with it. Over these parts of the program, Ben-Hur sped with rapid eyes. At last he came to the announcement of the race. He read it slowly. Attending lovers of the heroic sports were assured they would certainly be gratified by an Orestian struggle unparalleled in Antioch. The city offered the spectacle in honor of the consul, one hundred thousand sesteri and a crown of laurel were the prizes. Then followed the particulars. The entries were six in all, four only permitted, sorry, fours only permitted. And to further interest in the performance, the competitors would be turned into the course together. Each four then received description. A four of Lysippus the Corinthian, two greys, a bay, and a black, entered at Alexandria last year and again at Corinth, where they were winners, Lysippus, driver, color, yellow. Number two. A four of Messala of Rome, two white, two black, victors of the Circensian as exhibited in the Circus Maximus last year. Messala, driver, colors, scarlet and gold. Number three, a four of Cleanthes of Athenian, or the Athenian, three greys, one bay, winners at the Isthmian last year, Cleanthes, driver, color, green. Number four, a four of Dicus the Byzantine, two blacks, one gray, one bay, Winners this year at Byzantium, Dicus, the driver. Color, black. Number five, a four of Admentus, the Sidonian. All greys, thrice entered at Caesarea, and thrice victors. Admetus, driver. Color, blue. Number six, a four of Ilderum, Sheik of the desert. All bays, first race. Ben-Hur, a Jew, driver. Color, white. Ben-Hur, a Jew, driver. Why that name instead of Arius? Ben-Hur raised his eyes to Ilderim. He had found the cause of the Arab's outcry. Both rushed to the same conclusion. The hand was the hand of Messala. Chapter 11, Making the Wagers. Here we go. Evening was hardly come upon Antioch when the... I can't read that word. Omphalus. Omphalus. Sorry, it crosses a line. So it... When the Omphalus, nearly in the center of the city, became a troubled fountain, from which in every direction, but chiefly down to the Nymphaeum, and east and west along the colonnade of Herod, flowed currents of people, for the time given up to Bacchus and Apollo. For such indulgence anything more fitting cannot be imagined than the great roofed streets, which were literally miles on miles of porticos wrought of marble, polished to the last degree of finish, and all gifts to the voluptuous city by princes careless of expenditure, when in, as in this instance, they thought they were etern eternizing themsel themselves. Eternalizing? Etern e I'm, I think that that word is rooted with eternal oh you can't read it because it's opposite but um anyway darkness was not permitted anywhere and the singing the laughter the shouting were incessant and in compound like the roar of waters dashing through hollow grots confused by a multitude of echoes 
The many nationalities represented, though they may have been amazed a stranger, were not peculiar to Antioch. Of the various missions of the great empire, one seems to have been the fusion of men and the introduction of strangers to each other. Accordingly, whole peoples rose up and went at pleasure, taking with them their costumes, customs, speech, and gods. And where they chose, they stopped, engaged in business, built houses, erected altars, and were what they had been at home. There was... There was a peculiarity, however, which could not have failed and notice the notice of a looker-on this night in Antioch. Nearly everybody wore the colors of one or other of the charioteers announced for the morrow's race. Sometimes it was in form of a scarf, sometimes a badge, often a ribbon or a feather. Whatever the form, it signified merely the wearer's partiality. Thus Green published a friend of Cleanthes, the Athenian, and Black, an adherent of the Byzantine. This was according to a custom, old probably as the day of the race of Orestes. By the way, worthy of study as a marvel of history, illu illustrative of the absurd yet appalling extremities to which men frequently suffer their follies to drag them. The observer abroad in this occasion, once attracted to the wearing of colors, would have, would have very shortly decided that there were three in pre predominance, green, white, and the mixed scarlet and gold. But let us from the streets to the palace on the island. Now, if you were reading this book on your own, you would look over onto the page prior and remember that the uh, green is the Athenian and the white is the, um, the sheik of the desert, Ilderum, and the mixed scarlet and gold is, of course, Messala of Rome. But let us from the streets to the palace on the island. The five great chandeliers in the salon are freshly lighted. The assemblage is much the same as that already noticed in connection with the place. The divan has its core of sleepers and burden of garments, and the tables yet resound with the rattle and clash of dice. Yet the greater part of the company are not doing anything. They walk about or yawn tremendously, or pause as they pass each other to exchange idle nothings. Will the weather be fair tomorrow? Are the preparations for the games complete? Do the laws of the circus in Antioch differ from the laws of the circus in Rome? Truth is, the young fellows are suffering from ennui. Their heavy work is done. That is, we would find their tablets, could we look at them, covered with memoranda of wagers, wagers on every contest, on the running, the wrestling, the boxing, on everything but the chariot race. And why not on that? Good reader, they cannot find anybody who will hazard so much as a denarius with them against Messala. There are no colors in the salon but his. No one thinks of his defeat. Why, they say, is he not perfect in his training? Did he not graduate from an imperial lanista? Were not his horses winners at the Circusian in the Circus Maximus? And then, ah, yes, he is a Roman! In a corner, at ease on the divan, Masala himself may be seen. Around him, sitting or standing, are his courtierly admirers, plying him with questions. There is, of course, but one topic, inter Drusus and Cilicius. Cecilius, sorry. Ah, cries the young prince, throwing himself on the divan at Masala's feet. Ah, by Bacchus, I am tired. Whither away? asks Masala. Up the street up to the Omphalus and beyond. Who shall say how far? Rivers of people, never so many in the city before. They say we will see the whole world at the circus tomorrow. Masala laughed scornfully. The idiots, Purple. They never beheld a Circensian with Caesar for editor. But my, Drusus, what found you? Nothing. Oh, ah, you forget, said Circilius. What? asked Drusus. The procession of whites. Miriable, cried Jusus, half rising. We met a faction of whites, and they had a banner, but ha 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 ha! He fell back indolently. Cruel Drusus, not to go on, said Messala, 
scum of the desert were they, my Masala, and garbage eaters from Jacob's temple in Jerusalem. What had I to do with them? Nay, said Cecilius, Drusus is afraid of a laugh, but I am not, my Masala. Speak thou then. Well, we stopped the faction, and— Offered them a wager, said Drusus, relenting and taking the word from the shadow's mouth. And <laughs> one fellow with not enough skin on his face to make a worm for a carp stepped forth. And <laughs> yes, I drew my tablets. Who is your man? I asked. Ben-Hur the Jew, said he. Then I, what shall it be? How much? He answered. Uh, excuse me, Miss Allah. By Jove's thunder, I cannot go on for laughter. <laughs> The listeners leaned forward. Masala looked to Cecilius. A shekel, said the latter. A shekel? A shekel? A burst of scornful laughter ran fast upon the repetition. And what did Drusus? asked Masala. An outcry over about the door just then occasioned a rush to that quarter. And as the noise there continued and grew louder, even Cecilius betook himself off pausing only to say the noble drusus my masala put up his tablets and lost the shekel a white a white let him come this way this way these and like exclamations filled the salon to the stoppage of the other speech the dice players quit their games the sleepers awoke rubbed their eyes and drew their tablets and hurried to the common center i offer you and i i the per person so warmly received was the respectable Jew, Ben-Hur's fellow voyager from Cyprus. He entered grave, quiet, observant. His robe was spotlessly white. So was the cloth of his turban. Bowing and smiling at the welcome, he moved slowly toward the central table. Arrived there, he drew his robe about him in a stately manner, took seat, and waved his hand. The gleam of a jewel on his finger helped him not a little to silence which ensued. Romans, most noble Romans, I salute you, he said. Easy by Jupiter, who is he? asked Drusus. A dog of Israel, Sanballat by his name, purveyor for the army, residence, Rome, vastly rich, grown so as a contractor of furnishments which he never furnishes. He spins mischiefs, nevertheless, finer than spiders spin their webs. Come, by the girdle of Venus, let us catch him. Messala arose as he spoke, and, with Drusus, joined the mass crowded about the purveyor. It came to me on the street, said that person, producing his tablets and opening them on the table with an impressive air of business, that there was great discomfort in the palace because offers on Messala were going without takers. The gods, you know, must have sacrifices, and here I am. You see my color. Let us to the matter. Odds first, amounts next. What will you give me? The audacity seemed to stun his hearers. Haste, he said. I have the engagement with the council. The consul, sorry. The spur was effective. Two to one, cried half a dozen in a voice. What? exclaimed the purveyor, astonished. Only two to one? And yours is a Roman? Take three, then. Three, you say, only three, and mine but a dog of a Jew. Give me four. Four it is, said a boy, stung by the taunt. Five, give me five, cried the purveyor instantly. A profound stillness fell on the assemblage. The consul, your master and mine, is waiting for me. The inaction became awkward to the many. Give me five for the honor of Rome. Five. Five, let it be, said one in answer. There was a sharp cheer, a commotion, and Messala himself appeared. Five, let it be, he said, and Sanballat smiled and made ready to write. If Caesar die tomorrow, he said, Rome will not be all bereft. There is at least one other with spirit to take his place. Give me six. Six be it, answered Messala. There was another shout louder than the first. Six be it, repeated Messala. Six to one, the difference between a Roman and a Jew. And having found it now, O redemptor of the flesh of swine, let us on the amount, and quickly the consul may send for thee, and I will then be bereft. 
Sanballat took the laugh against him coolly and wrote and offered the writing to Masala. Read, read, everybody demanded, and Masala read. <clears throat> Chariot race, Masala of Rome, in wager with Sanballat, also of Rome, says he will beat Ben-Hur, the Jew. Amount of wager, twenty talents. Odds to Sanballat, six to one. Witnesses, Sanballat. There was no noise, no motion. Each person seemed held in the pose the reading found him. Masala stared at the memorandum while the eyes which had him in view opened wide and stared at him. He felt the gaze and thought rapidly. So lately he stood in the same place and in the same way hectored the countrymen around him. They would remember it. If he refused to sign, his heroship was lost. And sign he could not. He was not worth one hundred talents, nor the fifth part of the sum. Suddenly his mind became a blank. He stood speechless. The color fled his face. An idea at last came to his relief. Thou, Jew, he said, where hast thou twenty talents? Show me. Sanballat's provoking smile deepened. There, he replied, offering Masala a paper. Read, read, arose all around. Again, Masala read, at Antioch, Tammuz, sixteenth day, the bearer, Sanballat of Rome, hath now his to his order with me fifty talents, coin of Caesar, Simonidus. Fifty talents? Fifty talents? echoed the throng in amazement. Then Drusus came to the rescue. By Hercules, he shouted, the paper lies, and the Jew is a liar. Who but Caesar hath fifty talents at order? Down with the insolent white. The cry was angry, and it was angrily repeated, yet Sandalat kept his seat, and his smile grew more exasperating the longer he waited. At length Messala spoke. Hush! One to one, my countrymen, one to one, for love of our ancient Roman name. The timely action recovered him his ascendancy. O oh, thou circumcised dog, he continued to Sanballat, I give thee six to one, did I not? Yes, said the Jew quietly. Well, give me now the fixing of the amount. With reserve, if the amount be trifling, have thy will, answered Sanballat. Write then five in place of twenty. Hast thou so much? By the mother of the gods, I will show you the receipts. Nay, the word of so brave a Roman must pass. Only make the sum even, six make it, and I will write. Write it so, and forthwith they exchanged writings. Sanballat immediately arose and looked around him, a sneer in place of his smile. No man better than he knew those who, with whom he was dealing. Romans, he said, another wager if you dare, five talents against five talents, that the white will win. I challenge you collectively. They were again surprised. What? he cried louder. Shall it be said in the circus tomorrow that a dog of Israel went into the salon of the palace full of Roman nobles, among them the scion of the Caesar, and laid five talents before them in challenge, and they had not the courage to take it up? The sting was unendurable. Have done, O oh insolent! said Drusus. Write the challenge and leave it on the table, and tomorrow, if we find thou hast indeed so much money to put at, at such hopeless hazard, I, Drusus, promise it shall be taken. Sanballat wrote again, and rising said, unmoved as ever, say Drusus, sorry, see Drusus, I leave the offer with you. When it is signed, Send it to me any time before the race begins. I will be found with the consul in a seat over the Porta Pompey. Peace to you, peace to all. He bowed and departed, careless of the shout of derision which they pursued him out of the door. In the night, the story of the prodigious wager flew along the streets and over the city, and Ben-Hur, lying with his four, was told of it, and also that Messala's whole fortune was on the hazard, and he slept never so soundly. Chapter 12 is called The Circus, and the first word is the. And who says we go on? Let's see how long this is. Where, where you, where it is. What? Circus. JJ's right. It's not super long, but. 
So if you want us to keep going, let us keep going. Uh, something I forgot to mention at the beginning. In the process of doing all the lookings up uh, so that I could um, attach all the timestamps, I also attached a link. So if you want to purchase any of the books that we're reading from Amazon or whatever, then you can do so. Um, for So I did that for Mara, Dart of the Nile, and for the Bronze Bow. When I got to Ben-Hur, I looked it up on Amazon, and they had a retelling of Ben-Hur was the first listing on Amazon that was written by someone named Carol Wallace. I don't know. I didn't do a lot of research. I don't know if she's related to Lou Wallace or not, but um, it was basically a retelling. I think that it's basically a movie novelization of the movie that came out in 2016, question mark. Um, which wasn't as good as the movie that came out with Charlton Heston, which is the movie that we will be watching after we're done reading this book, um, as the Sneathan Sieben or um, the tradition. what? Tradition. Yeah, as as our tradition. Um, so, um, but I did find in thrift books. I found this very edition. It's a it's actually a Reader's Digest version, which is um, the full um, unabridged version. And you can have it new, not sorry, not new. The new version was $25, but the used, very good, was $5, and good was $4.49. So if you wanted to order it, then Thrift Books, and I've got a link. I um, haven't put it in all the descriptions, but I did put it in the playlist description. So if you want to purchase it, there's obviously, I mean, I'm not getting anything out of it at all. But if you want to, then that's what we have. Um, so if you want me to keep going, then please, by all means, let me know. We can read one more chapter today if you desire. Yes. Kimmy says yes. Go for it. Mom says go for it. Uh -huh. All right, I've got Becca and, and Granny Bear on the computer. They're not saying nothing. But I'll just keep reading. So if y'all don't like it, y'all can read, watch the, watch the, um, watch the replay. Chapter twelve, the circus. So this is going to be a little bit longer recording tonight, but it's all right. The circus at Antioch stood on the south bank of the river, nearly opposite the island, differing in no respect from the, pa the plan of such buildings in general. In the purest sense, the games were a gift to the public. Consequently, everybody was free to attend, and, vast as the holding capacity of the structure was, so fearful were the people on this occasion, lest there should, be not, should not be room for them, that early the day before the opening of the exhibition, they took up all the vacant spaces in the vicinity where their temporary shelter suggested an army in waiting. At midnight, the entrances were thrown wide and the rabble surging in occupied the quarters assigned to them from which nothing less than an earthquake or an army with spears could have dislodged them. They dozed the night away on the benches and breakfasted there and there the close of the exercises found them patient and sight hungry as in the beginning. The better people, the, their seats secured, began moving toward the circus about the first hour of the morning, the noble and very rich among them, distinguished by litters and retinues of liveried servants. By the second hour, the efflux from the city was a stream unbroken and innumerable. Exactly as the gno gnomon of the official dial up in the citadel pointed the second hour half gone the legion in full panoply, pan, pan, panoply and with all its standards on exhibit descended from mount sulpius and when the rear of the last cohort disappeared in the bridge Antioch was literally abandoned, not that the circus could hold the multitude, but that the multitude was gone out to it, nevertheless. A great concourse of the river shore witnessed the consul come out 
from the island in a barge of state. As the great man landed and was received by the legion, the martial show for one brief moment transcended the attraction of the circus. At the third hour, the audience, if such it may be termed, was assembled. At last, a flourish of trumpets called for silence, and instantly the gaze of over a hundred thousand persons... Am I in your way? Gosh, why did you move it like that? What? You don't usually have a camera like that. That's how I've always had it since oh, since we got this. Able to get through the hallway. Okay. Thank okay. You. Well, I mean. The doctor parking has to let the dogs in. I can't let the dogs in because the cat's trying to get out. So. Okay, you're good. <laughs> All right. Is the chapter the race? Now the the race is the last chapter in book five. So, um, we're trying to get there. We have to keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay. Um, <clears throat> At the third hour, the audience, if, if such it may be termed, was assembled. At last, a flourish of trumpets called for silence, and instantly the gaze of over a 100,000 persons was directed toward a pile forming the eastern section of the building. There was a basement first, broken in the middle by a broad arched passage called the Porta Pompei, over which, on the elevated tribunal, magnificently decorated with insignia and legionary standards, the consul sat in the place of honor. On both sides of the passage, the basement was divided into stalls termed carceres, each protected in front by massive gates swung to statuesque pilasters. Pil pilasters. Um, over the stalls next was a cornice crowned by a low balustrade, black back of which the seats arose in theater arrangement, all occupied by a throng of dignitaries, superbly attired. The pile extended the width of the circus and was flanked on both sides by the towers, which, besides helping the architects give trace to their work, served the valeria of or purple awnings stretched between them so as to throw the whole quarter in a shade that became exceedingly grateful as the day advanced. This structure, it is now thought, can be made useful in helping the reader to a sufficient understanding of the arrangement of the rest of the interior of the circus. He has only to fancy himself seated on the tribunal with the consul facing to the west where everything is under his eye. On his right and left, if he will look, he will see the main entrances very ample and guarded by gates hinged to the towers. Directly below him is the arena, a level plain of considerable extent covered with fine white sand. There all the trials will take place, except the running. Looking across this sanded arena westwardly still, there is a pedestal of marble supporting three low conical pillars of gray stone much carven. Many an eye will hunt for those pillars before the day is done, for they are the first goal and mark the beginning and end of the race course. Behind the pedestal, leaving a passageway and space for an altar, commences a wall ten or twelve feet high, sorry, feet in breadth, and five or six in height, extending thence exactly two hundred yards, or one Olympic stadium. At the farthest or westward extremity of the wall, there is another pedestal surmounted with pillars which mark the second goal. Remember, when Lou Wallace was writing this, we were not actually having the Olympics because they didn't start till 1896, and this was published in 1880. So he's, he's describing an Olympic stadium is what he's doing. The racers will enter the course on the right of the first goal and keep the wall all the time to the left. The beginning and ending points of the contest lie, consequently, directly in front of the consul across the arena. And for that reason, his seat was admittedly the most desirable in the circus. Now, if the reader, who is still supposed to be seated on the consular... consular tribunal over the Porta Pompei will look up from the ground arrangement of the interior. The first point to attract his notice will be the marking of the outer boundary line of the course. That is a plain faced solid wall, 15 or 20 feet in height with a balustrade on its cope like that over the car carceres 
or stalls in the east. This balcony, if followed round the course, will be found broken in three places to allow passages of exit and entrance, two in the north and one in the west, the latter very ornate and called the Gate of Triumph, because when all is over the victors will pass out that way, crowned and with triumphal escort and ceremonies. At the west and the at the west end, <clears throat> excuse me, at the west end, the balcony encloses the course in the form of a half circle and is made to uphold two great galleries. Directly behind the balustrade, on the coping of the balcony, is the first seat from which ascend the succeeding benches, each higher than the one in front of it, giving to view a spectacle of surpassing interest, the spectacle of a vast space ruddy and glistening with human faces and rich with valley-colored costumes. The commonality occupy quarters over the rest, beginning at the point of termination of an awning stretched, it would seem, for the accommodation of the better classes exclusively. Having thus the whole interior of the circus under view at the moment of the sounding of the trumpets, let the reader next imagine the multitude seated and sunk to sudden silence and motionless in its intensity of interest. Out of the Porta Pompeii, over in the east, rises a sound mixed of voices and instruments harmonized. Presently, forth issues the chorus of the procession with which the celebration begins. The editor and civic authorities of the city, givers of the games, follow in robes and garlands. Then the gods, some on platforms, borne by men, others in great four-wheel carriages, gorgeously decorated. Next them, again, the contestants of the day each in costume exactly as he will run, wrestle, leap, box, or drive. Slowly crossing the arena, the procession proceeds to make circuit of the course. The display is beautiful and imposing. Approval runs before it in a shout as the water rises and swells in front of a boat in motion. If the dumb-figured gods made no sign of appreciation of the welcome, the editor and his associates are not so backward. The reception of the athletes is even more demonstrative, for there is not a man in the assemblage who has not something in wager upon them, though not though but a mite or farthing, and it is noticeable as the classes move by that the favorites among them are speedily singled out. Either their names are loudest in the uproar, or they are more profusely showered with wreaths and garlands tossed to, to them from the balcony. If there is a question as to the popularity with the public of the several games, it is now put to rest. To the splendor of the chariots and the super-excellent beauty of the horses, the charioteers add the personality necessary to perform the charm of their display. Their tunics, short, sleeveless, and of the finest woolen texture, are of the assigned colors. A horseman accompanies each one of them except Ben-Hur who, for some reason, possibly distrust, has chosen to go alone. So, too, they are all helmeted but him. As they approach, the spectators stand upon the benches, and there is a sensible deepening of the clamor in which a sharp listener may detect the shrill piping of women, lost my place, sorry, and children, at the same time, the things roseate flying from the balcony, thicken into a storm, and striking the men, drop into the chariot beds, which are threatened, threatened with filling to the tops. Even the horses have a share in the ovation, nor may it be said they are less conscious than their masters of the honors they receive. Very soon, as with the other contestants, it is made apparent that some of the drivers are more in favor than others, and then Excuse me. Then the discovery follows that nearly every individual on the benches, women and children as well as men, wear a color, most frequently a ribbon upon the breast or in the hair. Now it is green, now yellow, now blue, but searching the great body carefully, it is manifest that there is a preponderance of white and scarlet and gold. 
in a modern assemblage called together as this this one is, particularly where there are sums at hazard upon the race, a preference would be decided by the qualities or performance of the horses. Here, however, nationality was the rule. If the Byzantine and Sidonian found small support, it was because their cities were scarcely represented on the benches. On their side, the Greeks, though very numerous, were divided between the Corinthian and the Athenian, leaving but a scant showing of green and yellow. Messala's scarlet and gold would have been but little better had not the citizens of Antioch, proverbially a race of courtiers, joined the Romans by adopting the color of their favorite. There were left then the country people, or Syrians, the Jews, and the Arabs, and they, from faith in the blood of the sheik's four, blent largely with hate of the Romans, whom they desired above all things to see beaten and humbled, mounted the white, making the most noisy and probably the most numerous faction of all. As the charioteers move on in the circuit, the excitement increases at the second goal, where especially in the galleries, the white is the ruling color. The people exhaust their flowers and rive the air with screams. Messala! Messala! Ben-Hur! Ben-Hur! Such are the cries. Upon the passage of the procession, the factionists take their seats and resume conversation. Ah, by Bacchus, was he not handsome, exclaims a woman. Sorry, that was a woman. I, uh, wrong voice. Whose Rom Romanism is betrayed by the colors flying in her hair. And how splendid is his chariot, replies a neighbor of such proclivities. It is all ivory and gold. Jupiter grant he wins. The notes on the bench behind them were entirely different. A hundred shekels on the Jew. The voice is high and shrill. Nay, be not so rash, whispers a moderating friend to the speaker. The children of Jacob are not much given to Gentile sports, which are too often accursed in the sight of the Lord. True, but saw you ever one more cool and assured? And what an arm he has! And what horses, says a third. And for that, a fourth one adds, they say he has all the tricks of the Romans. A woman completes the eulogies eulogium yes and he is even handsomer than the roman thus encouraged the enthusiast shrieks again a hundred shekels on the jew thou fool answers the antiochian from a bench well forward on the balcony knowest thou not there are fifty talents laid against him six to one on messala Put up thy shekels, lest Abraham rise and smite thee. Ha, ha, thou donkey of Antioch, cease thy bray. Knowest thou not it was Messala betting on himself? Such the reply. And so ran the controversy, not always good-natured. When at length the march was ended and the Porta Pompey received back the procession, Ben-Hur knew he had his prayer. The eyes of the East were upon his contest with Messala. Chapter 13, The Start. And we'll save that one for tomorrow. The first word is about. And that will be the beginning of the race, Miss Granny Bear, since you asked. And we should pretty easily finish book five tomorrow. So... Hope you're enjoying the story. Kimmy says, wait one second. Hope you're enjoying the story. Um, I hope my ramblings aren't too much. Um, and here comes Kimmy. It looks like she's got some pictures to show us. Here we go. All right. Remember, it's backwards on the, mm -hmm. on the live stream. So um, I was, um, I took a picture of our cat, Ed. And I drew a picture. And he's got this little bandana. And I thought it was cute. I hope you all like it. All right, everybody have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow.